dismissal hearings. Mrs. Estes has served as a hearing officer in dismissal cases. She also has represented universities and insurers of educators. Let's please welcome Ms. Sharon. And the first thing y'all are saying is that why is she here talking to us about what we do because education and employment probably is not uh, top on your list of top things to learn about today. But one thing it does have in common, most of them, most of my clients are public entities. We run across the same kind of issues that y'all all probably are faced uh, day to day. You know, it's kind of intimidating talking to a group like this because clearly y'all are professionals in this field. Y'all know the nuts and bolts, the ins and outs of what you're doing. That's not at all why I'm here today. Uh, I, I liked the idea about the get out of jail free card. However, I will tell you, if you have a duty, have an issue with jail, do not call me. I could probably get you a life sentence by a parking ticket because I had no clue criminal law. Okay? To put you in touch with someone that you really don't want to be messing around with that at all. But as I said, you got y'all are the professionals in this field. So what I'm going to talk about is not anything to do with nuts and bolts about what you do, about how to do your job, about the hundreds of laws, regulations, administrative tidbits and rules that y'all all have to follow. Uh, what we want to talk about today as far as is very specific, so just sort of the things that can trip you up, the things that at the end of the day when you go home, you're sort of giving an uh-oh. You know, how do I get out of this particular problem? Why did this issue have to come up that I've got to deal with? Uh, you know, by your presence here, I think it's sort of pretty clear that y'all are not the group of, I'm going to use the phrase procurement uh, specialists or purchasing specialists. Y'all aren't the ones, I don't believe, that we're going to be, that we ever read about in the newspapers that. Gave the contract to your third cousin's brother in law because, you know, family is family. That's, you know, not the, the, the kind of uh, situation I think would be in this group of people, people that are all obviously concerned <coughs> with and care about professional development. But one thing we do all, all realize, I think, is that two things that can occur. Number one, Y'all are constantly faced with changes and regulations and procedures and how to do what you're doing. You get it from the state level. You get it from the federal level. I mean, you know, you know the in your bid processes, the documents you have to have to include dealing with foreign entities. Where does the money come from? Taxpayer issues, all those kind of things that y'all face on a daily basis. And so, continuing to keep up with it can be a full-time job in itself. I mean, without even looking at anything else you're trying to do. It's also, not only do y'all are y'all charged with a, a, what I believe to be sort of a monumental task in keeping up with all the rules and regulations that you face, you also, I think, and to me, this is the easiest place for y'all to sort of ever get tripped up on something, is you have to guard against becoming complacent in what you're doing. You know, you have to stop and think as a past relationship clouding my judgment on a particular issue. Uh, is this someone that has stepped up to the plate at some other time and maybe helped you out of a difficult situation? For example, I mean, if any of y'all ever had uh, a bid process, you selected your vendors, everything was rocking along, it was very imperative to your employee entity and either services being performed by a certain date, some sort of equipment delivered or product delivered, and all of a sudden the vendor disappeared on it. Or, I'm sorry. Um, but, or all of a sudden the vendor disappeared on it, failed to deliver. Or worse yet, you got a lovely bankruptcy notice in the mail. And so, you know, you've got someone else you could fall back on, and they helped you out. It's very easy to become complacent in those kind of circumstances and just immediately go to the person you know maybe helped you in the past. But if you're doing that, what steps are you bypassing? Is that something that could possibly trip you up? Another uh, area in what I sort of put in the complacent column is getting to know some people real well. 
tell people that, you know, it becomes sort of more of a casual kind of relationship, and over time you don't realize it's kind of built into maybe something more, something that can just give an appearance of impropriety. I had a good friend of mine who's actually a lawyer that used to work in our firm years and years ago, and he decided he did not like the uh, uh, private practice, and he went as general counsel of a, a pretty large medical device uh, manufacturer. And he said that from the day he took that job, he never again would have had to pay for lunch and probably dinner if he had not wanted to. That he was flooded constantly, particularly you know, from other lawyers wanting the legal business. But, you know, and, and it wasn't limited to lawyers, it was of course bankers and investment uh, uh, brokers. But, you know, it's amazing the type of influence, subtle, sometimes very blatant, they get that uh, anyone in a position to award something of a monetary benefit can find themselves in. So, uh, you know, I know what y'all all will, or you all will agree, is that maintaining the integrity of public procurement is probably, and some would argue is, the most essential element of your job. You know, when the integrity part of your job, when there are questions about how you perform what you're doing is called into question, not only does it put you in jeopardy, no one wants to be called in on the red carpet or something, but think of the black eye that it gives your employee entity. You know, none of us want to see the name of where we work in the paper for, you know, one of the, yet again, there is a problem in the awarding of a contract, the doing of this. You know, I'm from Memphis, and is anybody else in here from Memphis? Um, How many times do we get in the newspaper, y'all? I mean, really. You know, and, and not now as much but think back maybe 15 years ago. You know, it was constantly, you constantly saw the refrain, how did that group get that contract? How did they get that bid? Why did, were they the ones furnishing X, Y, Z? What was their track record? What was their experience? And then always at the end of all those questions was the big ones, who did they know? And so what, we want to always be in a position to guard against is having anyone come forward asking any of those questions about anything that we do. Now, you know, certainly all of all of you are charged to some degree, and I understand all of y'all's job duties do vary somewhat, but obtaining services, obtaining work in an efficient manner, products, all for the best price and in a manner achieving the best quality of available. But if there's not integrity in that process, then the process probably, and there are those that certainly would argue, that the process is fair. I think everyone in this room would probably agree that procurement as a profession must be done in a manner that encourages trust, both within your organization as well, and more importantly, from the public, you know, y'all have a much, I, th I think, harder, harder job than those in procurement or just saying how you want to phrase it in the private sector. Number one, they may be governed only by, depending upon the type of company, and, and you know, there are different worlds, is it publicly traded, is, is it not? But you know, they may have their own internal ethics, their own internal policies and procedures. They don't have the laws that y'all have to follow. And, but primarily, they don't have the scrutiny that y'all find yourselves under probably every day in what you're doing. Uh, but, you know, in doing your job in a manner that encourages trust, uh, particularly that from the public, you know, you want to do it through a manner that encourages not only personal but very formal accountability. You want to always be aware of avoiding any type of conflict of interest, and you want to do it in the most transparent manner possible. You know, hopefully none of y'all, again, you know, have ever uh, hit the papers, but I wonder how many of y'all, when, or if you were either watching the news or looking in the papers, and you saw that there was a Montana farm 
that was awarded a very small Montana company that was awarded an absolutely enormous contract to rebid power grids and resupply power to a lot of areas in Puerto Rico. And do y'all remember that? That was after one of the hurricanes. And with y'all having the experience and the know-how on how a contract of that magnitude should have been awarded, did any of y'all who saw that story say, whoa, who did they know? You know, how did they get that? I mean, really, Montana power grids in Puerto Rico, it just kind of makes you want to think, particularly given the fact when the whole story came out, how very small this company was. Now, I didn't look at the bid documents. I don't know the, the history of the company. It could have all been great, but I think certainly it raised issues. And a lot of those issues probably could have been avoided if um, there had been more transparency in the process. Admittedly, they were operating under an emergency uh, situation. It's not something that you would have expected a three month. Did this go off? Yeah. Did, yeah. I, did I do it? Probably. Probably. <laughs> I bet I didn't. No, I mean, I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> Technology is so not like y'all. That's why you got the PowerPoint. Like, you're not going to like this answer. Did I break it? No. It looks like it's not my fault. <laughs> not my fault. I want everyone to know that. Not my fault. I did nothing. Yeah, you know, it's bad when your kids, you know, when you want to like do something on their computer and they say, they won't do anything you ask them to except if you ask to touch their computer. Immediately, I'll do it because I don't want you messing with it. I don't know what's going to happen at the end of the day. Okay, so back to my Puerto Rico. Sometimes I think, you know, we all recognize that when we're faced with emergency services, something that has to be done very rapidly, there may not be that long checklist that probably all of y'all have sitting on your desk that you follow every time. But at least if there, I think if there have been more transparency uh, in that process, if, if the public had been more aware, if you know, if nothing else, if the media had been more aware, someone had instantly jumped on why this particular company got this got this bid. I think maybe there would not have been the the pushback uh, that 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 they all received in that. Uh, I don't know if that was something that was done intentional. I don't know if it was something that, that was just done because of the emergency situation that they were following. What I do know is what, what we want all of you to be able to do is, is come away with maybe a few ideas on things you can do to avoid ever being in a situation that puts you in sort of a vulnerable, um, a vulnerable place. Now, one way to do that is to have stringent, really strict accountability standards. What I'm not advocating, though, is you go back and you make a chart and you say, I will only look at vendors or, or suppliers or uh, bids from particular people on a list. You know, one thing that, that I imagine uh, stands out about those in this room is that you are here because you know what you're doing. You have experience in what you're doing, and more importantly, you do and you are dependent upon to exercise independent judgment in what you're doing, and you all have discretionary authority. Now, you know, when I say discretionary authority, I know we're uh, all guided by certain monetary controls that different amounts of, of, of procurement or different amounts of contracts may require different levels of scrutiny, different levels of authority. But how you get to that process is what everyone is depending upon you to be able to do, exercising your own discretion, your own judgment. You know, even if you have the perfect checklist in the world that if this is followed, I could never ever in a million years be questioned. That checklist has always got to include some uh, element that allows you to use your expertise in best pricing, maybe, terms and conditions, 
um, you know, looking at maybe innovative procurement methods, joining with other groups. We have to recognize at all times that what we want to rely upon and what your employers want to rely upon is your experience and your discretion and your ability to do your job. Certainly, there are no rules that will provide safeguards, every single safeguard that's necessary. There's no silver bullet. There's nothing that ever protects, you know, what you do from being maybe called into question or reviewed 100% of the time. There are some, however, some things we can look at that, you know, maybe at least will help provide a buffer or just, you know, <clears throat> make sure that if something in the process of what you're done is out of question, you can be assured that you're in a position to say, I met all the legal requirements. More importantly, it was transparent, everybody knew what was going on, and it was done in an ethical and honest manner. You know, certainly I, I imagine all of y'all live on the Central Procurement Office in Tennessee for certain policies and procedures. I would imagine most all uh, public entities have some sort of guidelines, you know, dollar amounts, who has certain authority, those kind of issues either contained within that document or probably certain ethical guidelines. Many uh, have not only in addition to, you know, the if y'all seen one you know, the ethics and procurement kind of kind of titled documents, there are also general ethic and ethical considerations, documents, and guidelines that govern the specific entity. I know, for example, the city of Memphis has specific guidelines, ethics, you know, kind of the ethics and procurement section, but then there's a whole section uh, in their administrative regulations specifically on this ethics and city employment. So it goes above and beyond. So y'all are subject not only to your, to your one employer, you know, you may have six levels of different requirements, some of them very similar. They must be working on the microphone in the room. Okay, if y'all can't, I will try to remember to keep talking loud, but sometimes I kind of slip back in. Um, now, again, going back to what we originally, what I originally said, we all know that you want to obtain the good services, uh, everything in an efficient, transparent, economical manner. But how do you always go about doing it? One thing that I would strongly recommend, and it's a, it's a term that, frankly, I kind of hope would disappear from general usage, but I think it's here to stay, is performing your flow to due diligence. Okay? A lot of times, let me hear that. A lot of times <laughs> we're in situations that will require um, an award maybe that goes only to a low bidder, maybe one to a highest scoring vendor. You know, you may have parameters. But if you go back and we look at the bid document, one thing that, that I think will assist you a lot and allow you maybe greater flexibility at the end of the day to perform the due diligence is expand your bid document. Now, I know that, uh, you know, some of you are probably thinking, oh, do I one more check mark to have to do when I've you know, got to stack this high already. But what if in your bid documents, if you don't have this already, you at all times retain the right that despite someone being maybe a low bidder or a high scoring vendor or in cases where it uh, maybe there's not a specific date or as part of the documents that you furnish aside from the monetary portion of the bid that you retain the right to go back and not only are you confirming that they meet the min minimum statutory requirements or the rules and regulations of your entity concerning financials, um, you have retained the right to take additional steps. You retain the right for checking references, confirming financials. Uh, do you have any information about past performance that might be a disqualifying issue? You know, if, if that sort of thing isn't 
in your initial documents, then what's the response you're going to get when this company you don't want to deal with them fit? You didn't have a right to that. All you said it was it was low money, or all you said it was high score. So give yourself the written authority, number one. But number two, if it's in those documents, then what you've done is you've created even more transparency in the whole process. Everyone knows going in that they're going to be subject to a level of scrutiny that maybe in the past they have. But what this does do is provide you with the ability to maintain more flexibility, but you've been transparent all along. No one can fault you ever and say, I didn't get the bid, they made up all, the, all these new rules that they were going to look into X, Y, Z, when it's clear in the documents, it's clear in the request, X, Y, Z was in there. You knew going in that this would be a possibility. This gives you the flexibility, the legal ability, and the ability, hopefully without question, uh, to exercise your discretion, to review. You know, you can look at past conduct. You all have experience with different companies, with different vendors. You know who does what they say they'll do. You know who has overruns. You know maybe who's, who's come in um, underneath budget. And so, you know, those are things that, that, you know, while you may not be able to give brownie points for certain things, you can look at the negative, and that does give you the ability, provided you retained it in your documents, to look past what is on its face, someone meeting all your specifications to a T, but let's, in, let's expand those levels of, uh, if, uh, of specifications. You know, the, uh, give yourself the authority to look at track records. Now, on um, having encouraged everyone to sort of look at what steps or due diligence might uh, assist you, might help you in, in, in your process. Um, if it's not stated on the front end, then I'm, I'm saying it probably would open you up to more scrutiny if those were steps you tried to in, implement after the fact. Okay, Again, it goes back to transparency. <clears throat> what you don't ever want to have is have a, someone submitting a bid or certain vendors that you utilize say, nobody ever told me that part. Okay. That's what opens you up to criticism. That, you know, nobody ever told me that. When did that become a requirement? When did that when did that element either disqualify me or knock me down two or three points? So, you know, everything's gotta be done on the front end. Otherwise, what they're gonna say is you're stepping outside the parameters of the bid process to try to select another vendor. And obviously. You know, what we don't want to do is ever have a bid process uh, where we end up not going with the, with the winning bid based upon how the winner is defined in your initial bid documents, your request for proposals, those kind of things. Um, okay, sort of changing a little bit. How many of y'all have heard, or maybe I should say, how many times a month do y'all hear the phrase, Avoiding conflicts of interest. I mean, it's probably, yeah, something that, that comes up daily. I'm sure every seminar you've ever gone to, someone has, you know, come up with this marvelous new thought that you might want to consider avoiding conflicts of interest. We've all heard it, you know, I mean, going in, in you know, back in law school, we have our definition of what a conflict of interest is. And believe me, you don't ever want to get tied up in that situation. Large firms and because our firm merged a few years ago, we're now a you know kind of large firm. You know we have committees that address conflicts of interest. <clears throat> that you know it's just something you don't ever want to be in a situation where someone says, "Didn't you see that you had a conflict in that circumstance?" You know some of them are so easy to recognize. You know for a law firm, uh, you know if I represent uh, John Jones in a lawsuit involving a car wreck, my partner next door can't represent Mary Smith who caused the car wreck because Mary is saying John caused the car wreck and you know the other lawyer and I aren't going to sit back and forth discussing the case. Those conflicts are easy. 
conflicts uh, that are not as easy to recognize, though, are the ones are the ones that are likely to trip you up. You know, we all know. Go back to the brother-in-law that's going to be at Thanksgiving dinner, who owns the tow truck company, and your city has a contract for towing services. You know, for some reason, towing services end up being paper more than that. maybe members. Maybe we just have have more of that. But really, we get that that issue in the newspaper a lot. But you know, that's the easy conflict of interest to recognize. Ones that may not be so easy are uh, when you have private investments in a company or, or a relative has an investment in a company. They could just be a totally silent partner, silent investor. It could be you know, some sort of limited uh, 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 partnership that you don't even realize that they are participating in. You know, that's why it's, it's so important to find out, particularly with smaller companies, who owns it? Who are your investors? Because that's the kind of thing that, that you could end up without even knowing that someone does have an interest in that. It's another thing, perhaps, in your due diligence documents is to take a harder look at who the, who the owners are of the companies that you're dealing with. You know, in some instances, arguably, it would be so far removed that, that uh, and certainly, I, and, and let me also say, I'm not implying at all that. You know, your third cousin who's an investor in the tow company is going to give you a kickback for making sure they get the contract. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is, is when that tow company, uh, towing company, doesn't make the runs that it's required to, or cars are left abandoned on the streets, and then there we are in the newspaper, or, you know. I'm kind of dating myself. It's not the newspaper anymore, not on the internet. But you know the articles that are there in the dozen publications, and all of a sudden it's going to come out that maybe you know there was some sort of connection back to the person who awarded the contract. You know you want to be in a position to say, we looked at that issue. We know who all the owners of a company are. We know who the silent partners are. We know who the investors are. We addressed that. There was no uh, uh, benefit given. In fact, we ran it by. Now, for those of you who work for entities that are large enough, there may be a separate ethics or some side of oversight division within your company. Certainly, if anybody hears with the state, you know, it's there. Uh, some of uh, smaller municipalities, educational institutions, governmental entities may not have that. But at a minimum, you can say it was addressed. You know, it went to my director or I assembled four more people on my team. We all looked at this issue. We were comfortable going forward that this particular connection was so far removed that no one could argue that there was any influence, any conflict of interest, nothing I did that changed my influence or affected my judgment in any manner. Okay. Another, uh, if you ever have questions on, is there some sort of relationship that's too close? I'm sure everyone in this room has either, you know, the city attorney, the county attorney, the school board attorney. Whatever entity you're working with, get a legal team. Let them look through. Take yourself out of a sort of out of the line of fire, if you will. Number one, it shows that you're on top of these issues. You're considering these issues. You are determined not to ever let these kind of issues affect what you do. Number one. Number two, and honestly, I'm not trying to drum up business for lawyers, okay? But I, I do think, and, and, and if you don't want the lawyer to at least, you know, maybe go to an, a, another division head, someone that's, you know, sort of maybe has been based with these kind of issues. Because it's amazing how sometimes when you look at an issue, <clears throat> you think, oh, that would never influence me. Or, or that's so far removed, nobody could question that. It's amazing when you get the second opinion on it, that how many times you might hear, whoa, you got to back off of this. Or defer, let the decision go to somebody else. Remove yourself from the process. Now, obviously, nobody wants to do that. Um, 
sometimes it's necessary. You know, I'm sure you've all uh, haven't been, you will be in the situation where you know or have a relationship with or very familiar with some entity that you know would do an absolutely fabulous, wonderful job or be the absolute best person for what it is or what you're trying to get done. You know, in those cases, avoid the appearance of a conflict of interest, avoid any issues regarding an impropriety, and just get a second opinion. Get someone to document what you're doing. Explain and explain. Be 100% open. Look, I think ABC Company is perfect for this. However, you need to know, I worked at ABC Company 10 years ago. I still have friends there. But I know... This is in their bailiwick. I know they would be perfect for what we want done. But just take the extra step of proving to everyone, the general public, it should they be the ones questioning or someone within your own your own entity, that you are aware that there was the potential for claims of a conflict of interest, and you jump a gun, you beat them to it. You address this. You know. It can, you can be subject to um, questions concerning conflict of interest. Conflict of interest doesn't always have to be because you have a direct or a family member has a direct financial interest. Does it just come from favoritism? Is it someone you've worked with time and time again? Again, go back to that company that maybe bailed you out at the last minute when something was essential to what a project you had going on, it had to be delivered, and the company that had been selected failed in, in um, what they were doing. Again, now, you know, at first of this, I was talking about due diligence and being able to look into the background of, of different companies, and now that's a great thing as long as on the front end you tell everybody you're going to retain the right to do that. Well, sometimes the very thing we want a good track record or experience with a particular vendor or a company ends up being something that could create at least an appearance of a conflict. You know, how many times has ABC been the successful bidder on a particular process? You know, does and, and sometimes you're limited. You know, you don't have a choice. Unfortunately, a lot of times you may request bids and and the uh, response is no. And so, you know, you're, you're, you're kind of stuck in what you're doing. There may not be a huge pool to select from. Some things are very, very highly technical kind of things. And you may not have the option of reviewing 20 different responses to a request for proposal, in, you know, in, in what you're looking for. But if it's a company that time and time again always seems to crop up and always get the bid, Maybe it's time to take a step back and, and is there the degree or, or is the decision being affected because they're within a certain comfort zone? That comfort zone is what can kind of lead you open to why the question, why do they always get it? Now, hopefully you're thoroughly documented, you have all the bells and whistles, all your check boxes have been checked. And so, you know, there's nothing that, that someone can complain again, uh, about on that. But every once in a while, maybe it's a good time, it's a good idea to get a second review. I'm sure all of you have written prohibitions against rebates, gifts, compensation. Um, however, you know, always kind of be on guard against and make sure that um, it's not something that's kind of slipping in there and you don't even sort of realize it's happening. Suppose as you send out request and as part of your package of information uh, you receive you uh, retain the right or you have a requirement that you're going to visit their facility and because you know you want to say that they have the proper staff uh, perhaps you have requirements to make sure it's ADA compliant you, uh, you know there could be a long checklist of things that they want to meet they're not going to take anybody's word for it you're going to go physically look or you're going to send out a team to physically look, and all of a sudden, hey, we'll meet you at the airport. We have a corporate apartment you can use. Or maybe not even that lady. Yeah, we'll pick you up, let's do lunch first, and then we're going to take you out. You 
you know, shift changes at one o'clock. So your plane lands at 11, we need to kill an hour or two. Well, all of a sudden you're thinking, look, you know, the first time I ever got exposed to that was year, I'm not gonna tell you how long ago, it was a long time ago. And <laughs> I was in a deposition in Atlanta and um, the, the EPA was involved, oh joy. And this government lawyer, uh, we ordered sandwiches, you know, evidently in Atlanta, you don't go out because it's like we take a day. And so they ordered these trays of sandwiches. I mean, just big trays, you know, like you get from Jason's Deli or something. She made them produce the ticket, the, the credit card charge, <laughs> counted, stood, sat there, one, two, three, four, counted the number of people, included the court reporter, divided it, and then put her like $4.67 on the tape because she said she would get in, and I was just going, you're really kidding me for a crummy chicken salad sandwich. But they evidently, uh, it is just total taboo. Do not ever even take, you know, she wouldn't take a soft drink, okay? And this law firm was one of those mega law firms they represented Coke, and so they had Fountain Coke deals on. <laughs> she wouldn't even do that, you know? And, and I was amazed, but if you think it through, that's a minor. But, you know, could anyone have ever accused uh, the EPA through their DOJ representative attorney of being influenced in some way? Now, trust me, you weren't going to influence her. But if it was somebody different, maybe the argument could have been there. It's little things like that that you have to guard against, that you can get tripped up, tripped up with. Uh, Closely related to the conflict of interest is what I, I, I think is sort of the general, and I know y'all heard these before, the duty to act in good faith and fair dealing. Okay? You want everybody to be on an equal footing, and you want to document and make sure that you can always show everybody in the process had the exact same opportunity, the exact same rules, regulations, degree of scrutiny, and in each and every time, each thing that you reviewed was free from any influence from any other factors. Now, what happens, uh, I'm sure most of y'all have probably dealt with maybe a whole lot more than you want to when you have formal bid processes, and particularly those in construction <coughs> processes. And so, you know, you have the magic on board. Okay, what happens when that magic envelope's 15 minutes late? There you go. Okay, and even though you know this company's good, but you know, they come in, I got stuck in traffic, the uh, ADD overpass or bypass is closed, and you know, they're figuring out how to get around. You know, I'm sorry. You know, that's one of those, you too bad, so sad kind of thing. You can't do it. Um, what about, uh, you know, when they submit the envelope and it's missing information or it's got too much information. And, you know, you always cut, there's a tendency, I think, to say, oh man, you know, you, you want to almost hand it back to them and say, hey, you forgot to X, Y, Z, okay? But you got to keep in the back of your mind unless, one, the statute allows that, or two, you look at every single person giving you that bid and say, hey, you forgot X, Y, Z, including the company that did the awfully horrible job the last time they got a bid. You can't do that. Now, I know, you know, y'all are aware if you do particularly like construction bids, they're an easy example. There are just ironclad rules that totally take away your flexibility, I think, in how you can do that. There is a very limited exception to correct typographical errors. Um, but other than that, you know, that during that process, you're kind of losing your flexibility. But you have to guard against kind of almost being the nice guy in that situation. You just sort of can't do it. You know, either they, they follow the rules uh, or they don't follow the rules. And, and that one, in that particular situation, that's kind of an up or down. It's either you did or you didn't. Uh, now, uh, 
you know, if you have an issue, if you have an argument, when you have a protest following those, I always recommend that no one person make the final call on that. Again, it sort of subjects you and subjects the, the whole process into being scrutinized. What I would do is, again, go back and assemble the team. I know that for many of y'all, it uh, depends on the size of your entity and the availability. If there's also, in some of what you do, there's a very, very defined area of expertise that my guess is 90% of the employers in your particular entity have no clue about what you're doing. They don't know the regulations. They don't know the, the involvement. They don't know the steps that you have to go through. So sometimes assembling the team may or may not uh, provide the, the level of expertise that you need. And, you know, in those situations I do, you know, it's sort of like what we do at work, you walk down the hall, but in your case, you know, you might pick up the phone to, to the other people and say, you know, I think I'm getting a on a type sort of a, you know, the highlight here. And, and what do I need to do to just kind of get off of it? Uh, again, go back to your initial bid documents, how far out of range are we, and then pull the Tennessee statute and those lovely administrative rules and regulations. And boy, if it's not in there, it's an exception. If it's not listed as something easily correctable, then it's just got to flat out be denied. Otherwise, you just open yourself up to all kinds of criticism, the whole bid process. And then you really will need to learn because you'll get sued by the person who's the next closest bidder. And you all know that that's typically, uh, you know, what would happen. Again, you know, that's the kind of thing you would want to absolutely document very closely or very thoroughly. You just want to be in a position to be able to say, you know, I did it because. Now, some entities are kind of moving from the bid process, are recommending, here's another one of my favorite phrases, in addition to due diligence, the best practices. I'm sure y'all have all heard that one like 500 million times. But is uh, to start engaging in what's been uh, described as a proactive transparency. And how many of y'all have already seen the articles, gotten the emails or the publications describing that concept? Concept. Some states have even gone to requirements for, uh, at least at the state level, and then a lot of times uh, municipalities or educational institutes will simply adopt the state guidelines as their model that everything's almost an open procurement process where vendors can even attend evaluation meetings. Uh, but, you know, uh, when you're you're opening the bids, you're reviewing all the contracts, maybe they get one the sealed bid kind of situation, you're responding to requests for proposals. Uh, sometimes maybe that uh, evaluation meeting is done where it would give someone sufficient time to lodge a protest based on the bid. Now, you know, that all sounds wonderful and a very pristine sort of world, y'all come on, this might just make your job harder. You need to get to another level, you know. I, I just, I'm not confident. To me, the open transparency has its value and its worth to me in making sure that your bid documents are clear, your request for proposals are clear, your product descriptions are as sort of clear as you can be, that public notice is thorough, it's, it's done in a way that reaches the most, people, the, the most uh, potential bidders or, or people submitting quotes to you. You know, I'm not sure that opening up the entire bid process or the entire uh, evaluation process following receipts from the request for proposals is, it, you know, while it may sound good in a, in a sort of vacuum, I think real world application kind of impossible or not practical and it's certainly you know at the end of the day what are we trying to get to and that, again we go back to where we started which is the best product the best price the best service the thing that gets done for your entity what it was you started out to get done. you know is it building the new library 
or is it, you know, getting rings of paper or copy toner, you know, at a certain price? I mean, you know, y'all sort of y'all have the, you know, new city hall seriously down to, to, to the tone, you know. So what is it we're trying to do? And I'm not confident that putting more layers of public scrutiny or public um, comment or input into the evaluation process is the best place to, to, to do to do that. I think it's the overall process and the notice, the descriptions that need to be thorough and transparent. You know, another thing, some of y'all, and, and again, y'all saw my great ability with technology, so I've been really good on this, is like when you're doing computer or for IT services, well, you know, I, I think sometimes you need an interpreter to look at, at what those people were talking about doing. I would. Um, you know, I'm always just real happy when I'm in and out on email and I haven't messed up anything. So, you know, I, I, the best job protection is to become a secretary to an old lawyer because <laughs> they can never, they'll never get the hang of all that other stuff. So, I mean, that, that, if you ever know someone looking for a career, that's job protection 100. Um, but, uh, you think of you think of me. I'm so serious. But uh, <clears throat> another thing you have to guard against is disclosure of proprietary information, trade secret information, uh, any uh, patent and process, any of those kind of things. So sometimes when you've got on the one hand people telling you be transparent, be open, we want to review your records, there's your freedom of information request. You know, all those kind of things. On the other hand, y'all are also sort of the gatekeepers and responsible for certain proprietary information or, or protected, to say it can be protected under a whole number of different areas. But if you're responsible for that, then, you know, that kind of puts you in the place where, okay, which one gets? You know, and I submit always it's going to, if, you're, if there's legal protection, then go with the legal protection. And that's the one that's going to have to take priority. Now, thank you, Debbie, to help me. We've got a few examples, and some of these y'all are going to think Mickey Mouse, okay, with some way. But sometimes it doesn't hurt to look at, go back to the ABCs, okay, you know, uh, to the very basics of what do I need to do to make sure no one can ever fault my entities purchasing, bidding whatever process, okay? Okay, so say Cirque du Soleil is coming out. If you, the first person to answer, you call them, okay? Cirque du Soleil is coming to town, okay? The tour manager understands that you are the city purchase agent, and they contact you and have agreed to save you four front row seats, yeah. okay? <laughs> How many of y'all have been there on that? No. I know. Not that you took them. Not that you took them there. How many of you have gotten the offer? You know? Okay. Fine. They want to give you four front row uh, seats. But, you know, they also need four hotel rooms for the tour manager and her closest friends that y'all insert the name of the nicest hotel in your city, okay? And so you're thinking, hot dog, you know, I can take the kids, they'll think I'm wonderful. So you decide the best way to do this is you contact the, again, insert name of hotel, and tell them that you need four rooms on behalf of your employer, okay? But you're paying for it. You're using the tickets, you're paying for it, but you know this hotel rarely has vacancies, but, you know, uh, they will always accommodate maybe what is in your city the biggest employer, okay, or for whatever reason because of a convention coming up, you know, they want to always accommodate you. Is this a violation? Oh, yeah. Okay, well, somebody's got to raise your hand because I've got great gift bags with things to fill up your job. <laughs> 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 I'm going to give some to Bernie. <laughs> <laughs> Bernie, 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 it's always a breach, and there are, or I bet if you go back and look at your uh, ethical rules, certainly if you look at the state <laughs> rules, it's always an ethical, it's always a breach of ethical standards for any 
city, you know, you know change your name to county education uh, employee or official to make or attempt to make private purchases in the name of the city or to use their position to secure any privilege or exemption for himself, herself, or others that is not specifically, and believe me, please latch on to specifically authorized by local or state law or policy. Okay? So the problems with this are several. Number one, why was this entity coming to you? What are they wanting down the road? Okay? Ah, you have four tickets now to an event that's been sold out for 30 minutes. Um, you know, okay. What do they want? Number two, use your class. You know, you have authority by virtue of your job to keep the amount of money you control, the opportunities that you have out there. You can all have a lot of clout, okay? So why are they wanting Are they using it for the clout, or is it some sort of future issue that they want, okay? Number two, or number three, the last thing you want to do is be uh, the one that people say, well, you know, they get all the good stuff. Because all of a sudden, if the rumor is about if they get all the good stuff, then someone's going to be questioning, one, why do you get it, two, what do you get, and three, should you pay taxes on it? You know, and then we get the IRS involved. And, but mainly, it, it kind of makes everything suspect on what you may have done in the past, okay? If, if, if you kind of walk, if you kind of accidentally get in those situations, you could have done every other contract, purchase, bid, in the absolutely most perfect manner possible. But what it does is it, it opens you up to scrutiny, okay? It just makes it, it makes every other situation that you've ever done be called into question. Okay, you, she gets a baggie, and like I said, everybody needs to for their junk board, right? <laughs> Okay, um, a member of a procurement team found a hundred dollar bill attached to a bed on her desk. Okay, now I know y'all are thinking the ultimate stupid example. I want to start this one while all of y'all are kind of rubbing your eyes thinking nobody would be that blatant. This is an actual case in Tennessee. Okay, okay, so I, this one didn't make up. Okay. So the uh, procurement uh, uh, member, team member immediately contacted uh, what the title, job title was the chief purchasing agent. They immediately contacted the attorney general. You know, you can't bribe public people. I and mean, that's a pretty big no-no, okay? The vendor who somehow had a $100 bill stuck uh, to a bid was asked about the situation. I know you're shocked, shocked, but the vendor had no idea how the hundred dollar bill got stuck on the back of the envelope. Okay, the procurement team decided to still consider the bid. Okay, the member of the procurement team who, you know, the person that accepted the bid or physically got receipt of the bid did not participate in the opening of the bids, in reviewing and checking the boxes to see if they uh, required with the bid specifications. No part of the process. That person just was totally backed away. And again, remember, the uh, team had gone <coughs> to, I guess, the director, the chief person, and they also had notified appropriate authorities. Now, was it a violation to still allow the bid to be considered? Yes, it is a violation. Okay. Does anybody say no? She gets the prize for answering this. <laughs> so no, 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 no. In this actual, it's a reported case in Tennessee, the position of the procurement team said nothing excuses the behavior of the potential vendor in attempting, although remember they denied it, to bribe a procurement officer. However, the procurement team was also faced with another issue. They were desperate for competition in the bid process. 
and they were in a situation where they were having very, very, oh, she must have experience. She's so shaking her head, have difficulty in getting the competition, okay? So what the court did was look in this case at the issue of not as much of the process, but what was done and viewed it strictly from the question of what's in the best interest of the end user agency, i.e. whoever it is y'all are out there uh, looking for bids. The procurement officials, the, the group on the team that eventually looked at the bids, you know, went down the check mark, made sure everything was in compliance, um, remained impartial. You know, nobody pocketed that hundred dollars, okay? And everybody kind of reacted to it like, whoa, um, the, uh, it probably didn't hurt that at the end of the day the contract was awarded to another vendor, but uh, a quote that was from a deposition that was taken in the case that the court sort of relied upon to so the chief, the chief purchasing officer explained, but still, even though everyone might envisioning this happening to them, Keep my fingers crossed it doesn't happen to you, y'all. Uh, it was a very strange circumstance that no one thought would ever happen again. He acknowledged that it was tricky. However, he said it was a strange circumstance that uh, they didn't want to penalize the vendor in case, you know, it was done by someone without authority, without the, the, the owner of the company's actual knowledge. And even though there was an appearance that the person was guilty, the purchasing group, the procurement group, felt like they had taken um, all steps that they could reasonably think of to do. They investigated and turned it over to the appropriate authorities and removed from the decision-making process the one person that was involved that they thought they had done everything to show the public and any other unsuccessful veterans that um, um, they've done everything they did they did to make sure that there was no undue influence exerted in the process. I think that that case is so fact specific that I would never encourage anyone to rely just upon that specific case for several reasons. One, I think if it's going to be rare where you see uh, someone still allow, I think your answer was initially correct. That, you know, when, even though there's this, you know, mysterious $100 bill stuck on the back of an envelope and everyone denies any knowledge of how it got there, I think any time when you have what appears on its face to be a blatant attempt to exercise any of y'all's judgment or decision in some impermissible way, I think there ought to be automatic disqualification. I also will tell you the case is quite a few years old, and I think um, there's probably a lot more accountability. There's probably 10 times the scrutiny now that all of y'all face, and then, then probably for those of you who've been doing this a long time, you faced 15 years ago. Yeah. Who was the package delivered? Was it by me or by person? It was delivered by hand. Okay. And so, you know, Another thing that, that, that's not ever in the, in the opinion is how much of a, a, a influence the recipient of the envelope got in the decision-making process. You know, you can describe the whole group as the procurement team, but, you know, honestly, if it's sort of the receptionist that did the intake part of it, the report, the, say, say you have a, a big enough group that you have sort of, you know, a hall a hall of, of city hall, you know, and, and purchasing in, are these five offices and you have someone at the front desk. Well, they're in your department, they're part of your team, but, you know, they may or may not really have a significant role. That was never explained in, in the facts as laid out in the court. So while that one is kind of nice to point to, like, look, we can clean up improprieties I caution you maybe not to rely too much on that one simply because of the passage of time. Yeah. I just have a quick question. When they do that, what do you what did the entity say they did with the 
Chicago. They turned it over to the Attorney General's evidence, so they were able to prove the bank of the Yeah, what would you do? No, I was just wondering, did they try to send it back? What did they do? So well, they the remember, the vendor says, I, that's not my hundred dollars. The vendor says, I had no idea how that hundred dollars jumped under the back of that on the you know, I'm just wondering I, what they, they don't give it to me. Yeah, I mean, what do you do? Do you give it to charity? Or do you have, do you have, a, have, a, you know, have a party Friday afternoon? Yeah. Luckily, luckily, what you do is you call in the authorities as evidence, and then they come and see it goes to some evidence room in the sky. Again, there, there goes my criminal knowledge sticking out. Okay. Um, a state central procurement office or translate, put any of your groups in there, issues a request for proposal. And an evaluation team or committee meets. Uh, and unfortunately, this maybe this would be one of those I was speaking about earlier, some sort of uh, uh, highly technical, maybe IT people. So they get a few subject matter experts that are employed by the state. You know, what they do is say, uh, dear uh, state of Tennessee, we need help on this. You know, I know uh, years ago when our, again, here I go, I'm so old. Years ago when our firm networked and we got, you know, we did all these computer upgrades and stuff, we realized that we were asking for uh, or trying to hire someone who we didn't even know what they were talking about, you know. So we had to hire a uh, uh, sort of a consultant to tell us who to hire to do the work. Okay? You know, nobody had a clue what they were doing. So, you know, I'm sure every once in a while, a lot of you have been faced with, or you may be in, in the future, faced with acquiring some sort of service or product that is so technical and so specific to needs that you have to have as part of your evaluation team some sort of subject matter expert, okay? And so, you contract with or you are able to acquire, you know, by some sort of reciprocal agreement, some sort of subject matter expert or group of subject matter experts to help you in your evaluation process, okay? Now, in this case, the purchasing officer noticed that one of the evaluators, one of these pros in the field, okay, one of this subject matter expert was named in one of the proposals by name, you know, John Jones is in here, and will provide training to your employees. Yes. Well, aside from that, for the evaluator, the evaluator certainly should do y'all all the favor and say, whoa, I'm out of here, not place the burden on y'all. But here we're with the situation where the subject matter expert, and remember, this may be something that is so technical and so limited in expertise that you can't go out and get five more substitutes in, okay? And maybe you're kind of far down the process, and this group has already been meeting for weeks. They assisted you in your specification portion of your bid or your request for proposal. You know, they gave you the technical knowledge I mean, that you needed to put together the request for these particular goods or services. But so now you've got someone who says that as part of this, what we're providing, all of your employees will be trained on this new product. One of the trainers is, what did I say her name was, John, Mary Jones. And it turns out she's one of your subject matter experts who's there evaluating. Okay, so in this case, the purchasing officer contacts uh, the evaluator and says, look, we're going to have to remove you from the team, remove you from the evaluation process. Okay, number one, is it proper for the purchasing officer to have that evaluator removed? Yes. Okay. Whoa, and, okay, that was the, that was the first hand. Okay, more junk or stuff. Yes, absolutely. You've got to remove that. person's going to get a direct financial benefit, right? They're not doing it for fun, I don't think. My guess is they bid out that way. They've got a good contract going to be, a, you know, a train the trainer kind of thing. And so there they are, and, you know, it's an employment act for them. Of course, they're very interested in your entity getting that contract because, you know, it's, it's 
uh, it's the way they're going to make a living. Now, this one I don't have to get to. Okay. Okay. Just, yes. In that situation, since you know that someone on your evaluation committee is part of that company, wouldn't it be something that that company, since they were the ones that set the parameter for the bid, wouldn't you eliminate them? Because they could have set the parameter so it would favor their company's yeah, the, specifications? That was the, sort of the part two of this. Do you still consider their bid? Okay, I think in looking at that, this is what I would recommend doing. Number one, don't make a call by yourself, okay? Assemble your team. Uh, if, again, if, if whoever you work for is big enough to have, you know, an ethics department, pull them in, get a legal opinion on it. But what I think you would have to do in this situation, aside from the fact that you potentially have a process that's now been tainted by this, is Probably what you're dealing with is a pretty limited field. You know, remember, this is something y'all have to go and get subject matter experts for. I bet you, you don't have a whole lot of competition in the bidding process as well. Uh, so, you know, it's a limited deal. So here you are, you know, you're getting in this very difficult situation. What I would recommend doing is assembling the team, go back and look at the bid process and the assembly process, how you put together what it is you needed. Did you get the request for services or, or whatever it is you're doing from one of the departments that you work with and when, what did they ask you for? Did they tell you to figure out how to set up our information system or did they tell you we need an information system that will provide the following 62 items? Okay. If they did that, then these subject matter experts were in the formulation process. So they didn't, as you said, steer the requirements to, uh, it has to be and someone with red hair wearing a blue suit, okay? I get the job. So they didn't steer it because they weren't asked to. They weren't asked to participate in that part. So, okay, you're kind of in the clear there. Uh, how quickly was the person removed? At what stage did you learn that there would be this impermissible influence or potential? What stage did you learn you got an uh-oh going on here? So I think you have to look at all that. The main thing you want to do is, is be very transparent very, and document. Okay. Now, am I over time? Yeah. Last one. Very quick. I'm sorry. I never run over time. I keep yelling. It's good stuff. Y'all are fun to talk to. Okay. A vendor's in town for a bid, and you are out at dinner somewhere. You let down. Guess what? You locked your purse in the trunk and didn't bring your wallet. Vendor recognizes the situation, waves at you. The waiter comes over, says, Don't worry, it's covered. Uh, you know the vendor. You've known them for years. They've done tons of business with you. They say, hey, we got this, don't worry about it, we'll pay you back tomorrow. You tell the waiter, tell them thank you. Any issues? Very innocent. You didn't even know you were going to the same restaurant. Any issues? Yep. Yes. Right there. Got it. Got it. Okay. You're, yes. And there are definitely issues there. Um, I don't know how you would rectify the situation, but it's just an upfront level of proprietary. Exactly. Absolute <laughs> prohibition. And, and remember, you know, the this vendors in town are part of the process, meeting with you, trying to sell you your stuff. Absolute prohibition they get about providing gifts because there may be some, aside from the fact that it just looks bad, there may be some expectation of a benefit or tit for tat in doing it. Now, you're right, you're still stuck with being accused of trying to grab a free meal, but, you know, maybe call somebody and say, hey, bring a credit card. But you just can't ever get in that situation. I'm sorry I went wrong. No, good job. Y'all are a fun group. Thanks. Thank you.